I have the distinct pleasure, before we start the presidential plenary address, uh, we want to celebrate um, our executive director who is retiring, Dr. Jack Fitzmaier. And one of the ways we one of the ways we've thought about a number of ways to do it because Jack is kind of skittish about these sorts of things. We've asked some of the past presidents to come. So will all the past presidents of the AAR please stand? This is amazing. Representing them will be the past president, President Emily Towns, the dean of the Divinity School and the E. Rhodes and Leona B. Carpenter, professor of women's ethics and society at Vanderbilt University. She threatened me if I gave her any, a longer introduction than that. And with that, Professor Towns. Good evening, one and all, and, and thank you, Eddie, for listening to my threat. <laughs> Jack, it is my honor to offer a president's tribute to you as you anticipate retiring from the Office of Executive Director of the American Academy of Religion. One of the tenets that my parents, academic administrators themselves, taught me about the mark of doing your job well is that you leave a place or an organization better than you found it. You have certainly done that. Much has changed under your leadership. A smaller, more efficient, and more representative board of directors, new initiatives and programs, managing a workable format for our big, big annual meetings, and continuing to nudge us to look at the next phase of what it means to be an academy that promotes understanding of and critical reflection on religious traditions, issues, questions, values, texts, practices, and institutions by fostering communication and exchange among teachers and scholars and the public understanding of religion. Further, an academy that serves the professional interests of members as students, teachers, and scholars. That should sound very familiar to you. You have given us the structure and the room to maintain vigorous, often vibrant, and often, often deep intellectual exchanges with equity, responsibility, and democratic accountability within the academic study of religion and in, in the world of the academy itself. Are we perfect at this? No. But it is not because you have failed to insist that we work toward this as scholars, administrators, students, and teachers. Each one of us whom I represent tonight have benefited from your strong and wise support during our terms in office. Each one of us has found your generous listening ear. Each one of us has been fortunate to experience your candor, even when it caused us to wince. Each one of us has found some measure of solace in your integrity. We have been the lucky few who have been damned lucky to have you as the executive director we have worked with. Yes, this is a big and unwieldy ship that you have guided over these last 10 plus years. You have guided its growth in membership in the number of colleges, universities, seminaries, and schools in North America and abroad. You and Martha, an earthly saint if there ever was one, have opened your home to so many of us in the academy. 
And for this, we simply say, thank you, thank you, thank you. On behalf of the American Academy of Religion and the staff and all the volunteers and all of the students and faculty members around the country, we present you with this gift. Jack is a stargazer. And this is a matched pair of phenomenal eyepieces. Woo-ha! <laughs> it is a Teleview Ethos 13 millimeter. Oh, that's what I'm talking about. And a Teleview Ethos 8 millimeter. Thank From you us. so much. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of overwhelmed, and I am skittish. Um, okay, Emily. I won't deny any of it. I mean, no. No, it's been a wonderful time for me. It's been an honor to serve and a privilege. Uh, I think I'd like to thank all the members of the AR, particularly the presidents and the staff. And I'd like to thank Martha Fitzmeyer, who has been uh, my North Star. I think that uh, someday in the future when my successor retires, this will be a very different organization. Um, we face some amazing challenges uh, in the job market and PhD production, uh, and they're going to be difficult to deal with. But I believe we've grown to a point and developed and matured to a point that we're ready uh, to face all those challenges. So I'm, I'm very grateful to all of you. Thank you so very much. And I think I'm going to go look at the stars. Thank you. Welcome to our presidential plenary address. My name is David Gushy, and I have the privilege of introducing Eddie Glaude. Eddie S. Glaude, Jr. is the William S. Todd Professor of Religion and African American Studies at Princeton University and founding chair of the Department of African American Studies. Professor Glaude hails from Moss Point, Mississippi which he left at the age of 16 to begin studies at Morehouse College. He holds a master's degree in African American Studies from Temple University and a PhD in religion from Princeton. He began his teaching career at Bowdoin. He has been a visiting scholar at Amherst College and at Harvard. Eddie Glaude's incredibly impressive career began with a dissertation and first book called Exodus a historical study exploring crucial early 19th century voices of African American racial advocacy. His next two books were edited works, the first a collection of essays on black power and black nationalism, the second with Cornell West, a vast anthology in African American religious thought. In 2007, he published a pivotally important transitional work in a shade of blue. It's some unique Glaudian combination of Dewey and pragmatism meeting up with Toni Morrison, James Baldwin, and the current politics of black America. In reading through this book, one can see the promising young scholar both exercising his scholarly gifts and training as a philosopher historian, and by the end, in his brave and insightful commentary on post-soul black politics, breaking through to become someone that Cornell West could rightly describe as the towering public intellectual of his generation. This growing public role is seen not only in Dr. Glaude's most recent work, Democracy in Black, but also in his increasing media, I was going to say presence, I will say omnipresence, 
in such venues as Time Magazine, MSNBC, and Meet the Press, and everywhere else. Getting to know Eddie Glaude for two years on the AAR presidential line, I can say that he is a fabulous colleague, a careful steward of AAR responsibilities, a courageous and resolute human being, and now a great personal friend. With pride and gratitude, I give you Dr. Eddie S. Glaude, Jr., the president of the American Academy of Religion. If my mama could see me now, Uh, thank you, David, for that gracious introduction. Um, it has uh, been truly a delight uh, to work with you and learn from you over the last two years. You know, we often try to make angels out to be some supernatural encounter, but angels come in ordinary time, and you have been one in my life, so I'm thankful for you. Uh, with your leadership, the Academy will be in amazing hands. I also want to thank Jack Fitzmeyer for his extraordinary service to the American Academy of Religion. With grace and humor, Jack has guided this organization through some difficult times. He steadied the ship and placed us on a safe path in some very turbulent waters. And he leaves this organization, I believe, and in great position to face the new challenges ahead. I want to thank you and enjoy gazing at the stars and revel in that wonderful granddaughter of yours in the next phase of your journey. I also want to thank the members of the board of directors, the staff, and all the volunteers that make this organization possible. Uh, Steve Herrick is retiring, and I want to give a shout out to Steve for all the work that he has done. The AAR is huge, as Professor Towns noted, with a lot of moving parts. And the staff and volunteers offer a remarkable gift to our profession. Uh, lastly, I want to thank the presidential lines with whom I've had the privilege to work. Tom Tweed tireless, decent. We wouldn't be where we are if it wasn't for him. And Serene Jones and David Gushy and Lori Patton, the care and dedication you all exhibit for the AAR ensures this organization will be around for the young child who today has found delight in the marvel of books and ideas and who will one day in the not so distant future join our ranks. Now, what we have done over the last three years is chart a trajectory for a 21st century organization. I've done that since day one with Michael McNally. We walked into the room together, looking at each other, asking the question, what in the hell have we done? <laughs> We've thought carefully about the values that guide our work, a commitment to academic excellence and professional responsibility, to free inquiry and critical examination, to diversity and inclusion, and to respect and transparency. These values flow from our overall mission to foster excellence in the study of academic, in the academic study of religion, and in addition, to enhance the public understanding of religion. And we do so with the understanding that specific agendas of who we take ourselves to be can threaten this organization. We do so with the understanding that specific agendas can bully us and threaten us. Nevertheless, we remain committed to the mission and to our values. Now, the landscape of American education is changing. Those shifts affect what we do and how we do it. They shape how this organization ought to respond to the needs of its members. So given that reality, we embarked on a strategic plan to guide our steps, and we did so knowing that Jack Fitzmeyer, the person who has done so much for the AAR, was retiring. 
the road ahead is uncertain. We are experiencing transitions in senior leadership in Atlanta. And like most ACLS professional organizations, we face the impact of declining membership, of the expansion of contingent faculty throughout the country. We confront the closing of departments and schools and the demands of the academic marketplace as faculty and students pick and choose what they need in the full light of diminishing resources. We understand that the AAR has to become more to you than a conference once a year. We also understand that we have to offer more to the nation and to the world. We live in turbulent times. And it seems everywhere we turn, religion is front and center, often nested with the circumstances of the most vulnerable among us, or serving as a means to make otherwise safe people extremely vulnerable. Religion can mark people as other and make them susceptible to unimaginable violence. Now, vulnerability, as I'm using the word here, registers a susceptibility to the arbitrary use of power that some among us, because of the color of their skin, their gender, the place of their birth, or the religion they espouse, all of which are overdetermined by histories that situate them in one way as opposed to another in relation to power, are subject, more so than others, to domination. Vulnerability then calls our attention to what is always, in an instant, on the horizon. It functions as a kind of preface or prelude to what is immediately possible because it is already in practice and instantiates a deep-seated fear and readiness in the individual for eruptions that can do irreparable harm. The biopolitical effect of domination then is an ongoing state of vulnerability that can be seen in the eyes that nervously scan the landscape in the white knuckled death grip on the steering wheel as the police officer approaches in the panic clutch of the child as the parent pulls her close. It is witnessed in the readiness for the eruption that could cost you and those you love everything. Just think about the horrors of what is happening to the Rohingya people in Myanmar. Think about the ways Muslims in this country have to endure the deadly consequences of deep-seated prejudices activated at a moment's notice and exploited for political purposes. Many of our colleagues could not be here because of the policies of extreme vetting driven by anti-Muslim sentiment. We need only look at what's happening in India under Modi's leadership and recall the horror and recall with horror white supremacists marching and spewing racist hatred in Charlottesville, shouting, Jews will not replace us. Or they gathered right in Boston Commons today. Religion and vulnerability can be seamlessly stitched together. Both can be seen in horrifically violent acts or in the quiet of voting booths or in the supposed serenity of church pews. Part of our mission involves enhancing the public understanding of religion, helping our fellows grab hold of the complexity of religious commitments in our social and political lives to understand how those commitments fortify our communities and deepen our individual sense of who we take ourselves to be and how those very commitments work to make some among us extremely vulnerable. PRRI is doing some of that work. Pew is doing some of that work. I believe the largest body of scholars of religion in the world should be doing some of that work. So religion and the most vulnerable was our theme this year, and we see throughout this conference, some of the best minds in the world bringing their skill sets to bear on the complex interrelationship of religion and vulnerability. I believe this is much more than a mere academic exercise. Too much is at stake for this organization and for you to sit on the sidelines in this moment. As an organization, we ought to do this public work not to advocate for any particular ideological side. The AAR is a big tent. 
our members range in their ideological views. But at the same time, we cannot, cannot allow those with the political agenda to hold this organization hostage, to threaten us, <laughs> to stake out a position of neutrality, to force us to stake out a position of neutrality that would, in effect, sanction a particular position that threatens the most vulnerable. In other words, we cannot allow some to weaponize our norms for their own ends. Instead, we ought to do this public work to dispel caricatures that often justify harmful policies and to call attention to bad thinking that obscures the complexity of what is happening right in front of our eyes. We, and to my mind, that means you, should be a national resource to help others better understand the ways religion affect the life circumstances of our fellows. Perhaps the AAR can sponsor an annual report about religion in the United States and around the world. Perhaps we can partner quarterly with PRI and Pew to generate data that will inform the public conversation about religious commitments in our public lives. Whatever form it takes, this organization must become a more active resource for the nation and for the world. In my view, these dark times call for a different kind of organization, a different kind of scholar. We must step into the fray, and we must do so with a particular understanding of the role and function of a liberal education, which includes the study of religion in our lives. So I want to use the rest of my time just to tax your patience as a, for a moment, uh, to step into my little preacherly moment. Right? <laughs> to take a step back and offer a general account of the view that shapes what informed my choice of theme this year and how I am imagining the work I'm calling for. And in doing so, I want to keep in mind something John Dewey, one of my favorite philosophers, stated so powerfully and prophetically. Quote, the crisis that we are undergoing will turn out, I think, to be worthwhile if we learn through it that every generation has to accomplish democracy over again for itself. That its very nature, its essence, is something that cannot be handed on from one person or one generation to another, but has to be worked out in terms of needs, problems, and conditions of the social life of which we are a part." End quote. I want to suggest that a particular kind of education, rightly understood, a liberal education, rightly understood, and the scholar who advocates for it have a central place in this effort to accomplish democracy over again. Now, in 1868, Thomas Huxley, the famous defender of Darwin and natural science, posed a question to a London audience during a speech entitled, A Liberal Education and Where to Find It. Huxley asked, quote, above all things, what is, what is our ideal of a thoroughly liberal education, of that education which, if we could begin life again, we would give ourselves, of that education which, if we could mold the fates to our will, we would give our children, end quote. What's striking about this moment, at least for my purposes tonight, is that it marked the beginning of an intense exchange between Huxley and his good friend, Matthew Arnold in which the two debated the place and significance of literature and science in a liberal education. Now, I don't want to bore you with the details of this particular 19th century example of the ancient debate between poets and philosophers. What I'm more interested in is what they substantively agreed upon, even if they meant different things by the formulation. In an essay entitled Literature and Science, Arnold in, Arnold included in his 1885 volume, Discourses in America, Arnold spoke about liberal education as the criticism of life by gifted men. Sick. He maintained that, quote, in our culture, the aim being to know ourselves and the world, we have as the means to this end to know the best which has been thought and said in the world, end quote. Arnold identified as such a liberal education with, quote, a critical effort, the endeavor in all branches of knowledge, theology, philosophy, history, art, science, to see the object as in itself it really is, end quote. And for him, this effort required an intensive study of the ancients. Now, Huxley agreed that culture and liberal education meant a criticism of life. But for him, this meant the free employment of reason in accordance with the scientific method 
and I'm quoting him here. So given his philosophical heroes, Socrates, Descartes, and Hume, it is of little surprise that life for Huxley leaves, quote, no doubt that we ought to place a higher value upon the advancement of knowledge and the promotion of that freedom of thought which is at once the cause and the consequence of intellectual progress. I'm coming to something, y'all just bear with me. Walk with me. Indeed, Huxley's passionate insistence on the significance of the scientific method might very well lead one to ask with Elias Canetti, quote, why must a poet be born and why must he die? Is it not enough that he must bear a name? Isn't that a sufficiently heavy burden by itself? But people have no mercy. They insist on cooking their poets, seasoning him, and then devouring him. So my purpose in invoking Huxley and Arnold's exchange, again, is not to assess the relative merits of a scientific temperament or an aesthetic sensibility. My sense of myself as a pragmatist leads me to believe that this impasse isn't a very useful one. But what strikes me is that no matter their substantive differences, both men held the view that culture, that efforts to know the best of what has been thought and said in the world, liberal education, is a criticism of life. It is at bottom a critical endeavor. So we, when we embark upon a liberal education, we subject ourselves and our commitments to critical scrutiny as we journey beyond the immediate horizon that has shaped our beliefs and choices up to that moment. A truly liberal education unsettles us, disrupting the familiar as it offers new pathways for self-creation. Indeed, a liberal education aims to forge the kinds of dispositions that extend beyond our more parochial concerns. It aspires for a cosmopolitan reach, our frames of reference, or acceptance, rather. Our frames of acceptance are widened. Now, the phrase is not mine. Kenneth Burke understood that who we are and the identities for which we are willing to die are bound up with orientations, frames of acceptance, and symbols of authority that form the contours of our motives and, and actions. Frames of acceptance are the policies we adopt toward the world, the attitudes of acceptance and rejection relative to the reigning symbols of authority. They constitute the conservative undertow of our identities that give us, in some ways, a sense of stability and for some certainty. It matters, then, if one's frame was shaped in the context of a Pentecostal or Shia household. It matters if one came of age politically during the 1960s in the United States or in the 1980s on the West Bank. It matters that our students are finding their voice in the context of Donald Trump and Steve Bannon and the opposition to them and their ilk. The prevailing symbols of authority impact our orientation to our fellows and to our world. A truly liberal education unsettles all of that by introducing the student through a range of subjects and methods to all the best that has been thought and said in the hopes of orienting them intelligently to a world in dire need. Now, you know this is an ideal, right? Much of American higher education is a glaring example of how often we fall short. We pride ourselves on our commitment to liberal education, but our history and our present times demonstrate the constraining effects of narrow commitments like those of white, suprem white supremacy and of patriarchy that undermine the notion that a liberal education ought to be a criticism of life or should be identified as a critical e effort. Instead, we reproduce, like many others, pernicious provincialities that allow our fellows to wallow in prejudices. That was a Jonathan, Jonathan Walton sentence. Right, to accept uncritically the status quo and to deny vehemently the voices of others. Today we see groups engaged in the weaponization of free speech on our campuses, taking full advantage of our norms and commitments to free and open inquiry in order to sow division and deepen suspicions that what we do and the places where we do it are bastions of socialism or radically, radical thinking generally, although I kind of like socialism and radicalism. We must work hard to pursue this ideal. Now, in a remarkably elegant account, a shift here, in what it means to be an intellectual, the late social critic Edward Zaid offers what I take to be an insightful description of the difficulties of a truly liberal education in today's academy. He claimed that the principal threat to the American academy was that of professionalism. 
And by professionalism, Zaid meant what? Thinking of one's work, quote, as an intellectual, as something we do for a living. Because the hours of nine and five, between the hours of nine and five, with one eye on the clock and another cocked at what is considered to be proper, professorial behavior, not rocking the boat, he says, not straying outside the accepted paradigms or limits, making yourself marketable and above all presentable, hence uncontroversial and unpolitical and objective, end quote. Saeed was a bad man. <laughs> this view draws on his overall sense of what intellectual work involves. That is a critical sense. For Saeed, the intellectual is someone, quote, unwilling to accept easy formulas or ready-made cliches, or, quote, the smooth, every so often accommodating con confirmations of what the powerful or conventional have to say and what they do, end quote. The intellectual, if I'm reading him right, is an exemplar of a liberally educated, an of someone who's liberally educated, an individual who interrogates frames of acceptance. But the pressures of professionalism within the academy often get in the way. Specialization, expertise, and the drift towards power and authority impede the production of such an intellectual. We narrow our area of knowledge. We declare that only those who have been certified by the proper authorities and speak in the appropriate languages can talk about a certain subject. And we allow the prerogatives of power to dictate intellectual priorities. In other words, we have a system that rewards intellectual conformity and cowardice all of which results in an environment in which asking hard questions and taking rude positions, as James Baldwin said, is constrained dramatically. In response to the threat of professionalism, Saeed embraced what he called amateurism. The amateur, Brother David, is that person who is driven not by profit motives, but instead, quote, by love for an unquenchable interest in the larger picture, in making connections across lines and barriers, in refusing to be tied down to specialty, in caring for ideas and values despite the restrictions of a profession. The amateur asks questions critically orients herself to the world as it is, challenging us in our moments of uncritical embrace and infusing our lives with a discerning spirit that helps us when, mo when most have lost their way. The amateur draws on the best of what has been thought and said to critique habits of living that undermine precious values that define the best of our way of life. So in my view, a truly liberal education aims to produce amateurs amateur critics of life. Now what might it mean then to embrace a liberal education in our current moment, in a time defined by the antics of Donald Trump, in a time of war, in a time of lies? To my mind, amateurism is necessary if we are to engage in the task of accomplishing democracy over again. It frees and empowers us to be daring, to be bold and courageous in the face of forces that would deny us freedom. And this is all the more important for the scholar of religion who can look out on the world and see the devastation that is happening in the name of what we study. Another transition. I happened to be reading the other day a fascinating little book published in 1959 by the former president of Yale University, A. Whitney Griswold. Although I disagree with his staunch anti-communism and his overall position about the Cold War, I found his defense of, Amer of, of academic freedom in the face of the demand for conformity quite compelling. Uh, Y'all all right? I'm just checking on you. You good? All right. One essay in particular stood out given the climate of our current times, Lori. Freedom, security, and the university tradition. It was a speech delivered in 1954 at the bicentennial celebration of Columbia University, Yosef. Griswold spoke to the implications of the Cold War on the form and content of American democracy, and he lifted up the values of liberal education as a check and balance to the hubris evidenced in the moment. He likened such an education to freedom. As he said, quote, for what earth, air, fire, and water are to animate nature, Freedom is to learning. A mind unfree, a mind possessed, dragooned, or indoctrinated does not learn. It copies. 
Learning implies discovery. The unfree mind looks at maps but does not travel. Hmm. It dares not for, not for at the edge of the map is the jumping off place. At the edge of the map is the jumping off place full of dragons and sea serpents. The unfree mind stays home, locks the doors and bars the shutters. It is a hero in a crowd, a coward in solitude. It is a slave and a sloth. Griswold was mindful of the forces, the pressures that would deny that freedom. He challenged them directly, and his words are worth repeating now, quote, over a large part of the earth, the concrete definition of freedom has utterly ceased, and in our part, it has almost slowed to a standstill. Why so, he asked. On the other side of the Iron Curtain, the reason is obvious, but at home, why should the life process of freedom falter among its creators, he asks. He says, partly because we fear and mistrust our enemies and must devote so much energy to protecting ourselves against them, partly because we fear and mistrust ourselves and choose to devote so much energy to catechizing one another. Griswold understood well that what is so desperately needed in moments of crisis is deep questioning, a healthy suspicion of dogma and a resistance to mindless conformity. Indeed, in dark and trying times, particularly in democracies, it is incumbent upon us to engage one another in order to imagine possibilities and see beyond the limits of our current condition. Participatory democracies are always fragile, and moments of crisis serve as easy excuses to discard the values that sustain them. When we stop asking hard questions and taking rude positions and provoking our fellows, we in effect cede our democratic form of life to those forces that would destroy it. Griswold, no matter his politics, understood this. He defended communists on his, on his faculty in the face of Cold War purges. Liberal arts education's task, my task, our task, is to produce those persons who will stand among us and ask the hard questions to exhibit the spirit of free and open inquiry, to, to produce persons unwilling to accept easy formulas or ready-made cliches, to produce amateurs even as they excel in their respective professions. In fact, we hope that their very presence transform the monotony of their professional routine, especially in times like our own. I hope the vision of what that education should entail is compelling to you, compelling to this organization, and I hope you understand why it's so important today as our children and family members die because of roadside bombs, fight in theaters we didn't know they were in, and as we listen to those in government justify placing them in danger. Here I'm reminded of George Orwell's brilliant insight. Quote, political language is designed to make lies sound truthful and murder respectable and to give an appearance of solidity to pure wind." End quote. Now, I recognize the irony of my invocation of Huxley, of Arnold, of Griswold, particularly in the American Academy in 1954, when Dr. Griswold delivered his remarks, not too many people who looked like me walked the sacred halls of our prestigious institutions. The prevailing sentiment of the day, even as the Supreme Court delivered its historic decision, was that we were not worthy of nor capable of truly excelling there. All too often, when it has come to the issue of race in this country, most Americans have been illiberal in their attitudes, too quick to concede to dogma and unwilling to challenge prevailing orthodoxies. And the presidency of Barack Obama did not constitute a ritual of racial expatiation of that reality. Donald Trump proves that point, yes? But I believe the tradition of these black people and the experiences of these folk tell us something profound about the nature of this fragile experiment in democracy. You see, I'm a part of a tradition of blues people which has found resources for democratic hope in the extraordinary capacities of ordinary people in spite of a wicked nation committed to wicked practice. The ideals of democracy inspired those who had been denied freedom and education to dream dreams, to imagine possibilities, and to hold on in the face of a withering storm to will themselves into a new day. 
where my mother had her first baby in the ninth grade and cleaned toilets for a living. And her baby is now here. The words of James Baldwin come to mind. To be Afro-American or an American black is to be in this situation intolerably exaggerated of all those who've ever found themselves part of a civilization which they in no wise honorably defend, which they were compelled indeed endlessly to attack and condemn, and yet who spoke out of the most passionate love, hoping to make the kingdom new, to make it honorable and worthy of life. I stand in a tradition that never believed the lie that this country was an example of democracy achieved but rather understood intimately its failures and shortcomings, its blindnesses and deformities. This tradition saw, nevertheless, not simply disease, but also possibility, understanding that the nation could have life it would, if it would only learn how to swing Duke Ellington style. I stand in a tradition that cultivated democratic dispositions in the face of strange fruit dangling from popular trees, insisted on effective freedom as they imagined a day that their children and children's children would be able to actualize their capacities and potentialities and struggle to ensure in their best moments that every little boy and girl would have access to the opportunity and skills to make good on the promise that is America. Now, what does it mean in this moment and in this place to insist on the importance of a liberal education in a time of war and in a time of lies. It is a call for us to be amateurs, to risk ourselves in the never-ending quest to expand our horizons. It requires of us to produce graduates who push the boundaries of, in the service of others, graduates who question and unsettle and who revel in the best that has been thought and said. It also demands of us recognition of the overlapping streams of experience, historical experience that dispelled the lie that all that is valuable in this nation came from white folks. That instead, this country, in its very essence, must be understood as an instantiation of the blues. And here we are in this moment insisting that this organization, that we, as scholars of religion, commit ourselves to the ideal of a liberal education, to prepare amateurs, to provoke a nation to live up to its ideals and that this task must involve centrally an encounter with these blues people, an encounter with the foundational lie that white people matter more than others in this country. Our very presence demands the kind of questioning requisite for the kind of education we aim to give. So this takes me back to where I began. Huxley and Arnold both agree that culture, the best that is thought and said, a liberal education is the criticism of life. And for both, Socrates was a hero. Arnold repeatedly invoked know thyself, and Huxley admired the relentless pursuit of truth evidenced in that dark, ugly Athenian. Socratic questioning is at the root of their attraction. It is the essence of a liberal education. A true encounter with the underside of American life, in my view, requires a profound examination of who we are and who we hope to be. And this may be our only true chance at saving our fragile democratic way of life as the disease of Trump and lies attacks our national soul. So I hope and pray that the AAR lives up to its mission. I hope and pray that we take the right path. I hope and pray that you train students who will dare to take rude positions and ask hard questions. I hope and pray that you understand that if you choose to sit on the sideline, you have chosen a side. And with that, thank you. <laughs>